like to welcome everybody to the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee work session today. Uh, as a reminder, uh, we will be uh, on uh, mute except for uh, to raise your hand when you want to make a comment or um, on there. And we're going to start today with our public comment. And so uh, I believe at this time, Melinda will unmute everybody. And if there's public comment, we'll give you a few seconds here to respond. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will be unmuting all participants now. And so everyone should have the ability to speak if need be. Is there any public comment? Do you see any hands raised? Uh, I'm not, but obviously we can give everyone a few moments. And obviously if there's anyone on the phones, just a reminder uh, that you just need to hit star six to unmute yourself, but obviously anyone logged in on the computer, you can raise your virtual hand and we will call on you. Okay. Not hearing any public comment, we'll close public comment then. And uh, at this time, so uh, Melinda, if you'll mute everybody again, and just a reminder as we get into the discussion, if you'll raise your hand, uh, then uh, Jacob or Melinda will unmute you uh, at the appropriate time to make comment. Uh, this is a continued discussion of the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan uh, before our meeting next Monday. And with that, Jacob, I'll let you uh, take it from here. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Let me pull up the slides here. Okay, so hopefully folks can hear me and see my screen of slides in presentation mode. Um, first, want to appreciate everyone who's on the line today. I know it's been kind of a slog of we've been, frankly, meeting weekly uh, the last couple of weeks, but I think we're making some great progress. Um, I think we're almost there. Um, <clears throat> to start out as a quick reminder, we started this conversation at the May 18th TAC meeting. Uh, we brought a lot of concepts and ideas forward about proposed next steps uh, for the 2050 MVRTP. Had a good conversation at the May meeting, but you know, lots of things to work through. So we had a work session uh, last Monday on June 8th, uh, where we worked through several things, and I'll recap those in a moment. Um, a couple more things that we said we wanted to deal with in the work session today. Um, so we'll we'll work on that, and then this is all leading up to our regular uh, TAC meeting next Monday, the 22nd, where we will wrap all of this together and uh, bring it back to uh, the full committee for um, uh, for endorsement or or approval going forward. So having said that, uh, recap from uh, last week's conversation, the June 8th work session. Uh, we think we got some overall consensus on what we've been calling the policy framework and desired outcomes, and I will show that uh, graphic again in terms of that planning framework that we're proposing um, to use to make decisions and take these next steps on the 2050 and the RTP. Um, we also had a good conversation around major investment priority projects solicitation process. I'll recap some of that here in the next couple of slides as well, uh, but I think we had some general agreement on that. We did say that we wanted to have further discussion on the things that you see here. Uh, what specific project types are eligible for the solicitation? Uh, so we'll talk about that. We'll be really clear about uh, what, you know, what we're asking for. Uh, role of the subregions of the county transportation forums in the solicitation process. How local uh, municipality and county plans and studies are incorporated into the framework. And then more specifics on how we're proposing that these candidate projects would be evaluated. Uh, for potential inclusion in the 2015 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. So um, just sort of a recap from last week. Um, you saw this concept last week. We discussed it at great length. Um, so I don't want to rehash that here, um, but I do want to make a couple of specific points. The notion here was, again, the reminder that the way we express priorities in the regional transportation plan, that there's lots of different ways we can do that. We can talk about specific projects, we can talk about categories, we can talk about the financial plan, uh, we can talk about the narrative of the plan. There's many, many different ways in which we've sort of expressed or make clear uh, what regional investment priorities are. Having said that, we are having a conversation about these regionally significant major projects um, that we're talking about a solicitation for 
uh, to build the fiscally constrained plan. So as you see on the right-hand side, um, this is just sort of a reminder, a refresher, of what are we talking about when we talk about these major projects? So some of these are federally defined for us. Uh, we need to include the roadway widenings of a mile or more. Uh, we need to include the new interchanges and interchange improvements uh, that add or delete major travel movements and interchanges. We need to include um, new rapid transit lines, fixed guideway transit, light rail, commuter rail, bus rapid transit. Those are all things that we need to individually identify as projects in the plan. What this does not include is local and collector roads, um, things that are below, so to speak, our regional roadway system, those minor roadways. Uh, we don't portray those in the plan. We don't include projects on, on that network. <clears throat> when we talk about um, some of these other things like project categories and investment allocations, these are, uh, these are components for which we may or may not have specific projects even if we did have projects that may not rise to quite the same level as the regionally significant capacity projects that we just talked about. So again, these are other ways in which we express priorities in the plan. Um, as we talked about at the work session last week, uh, these will be determined all of us together uh, through the interagency process. And we've been talking in the last couple of meetings about uh, some of these types of projects. Safety is a huge example, active transportation. Uh, we've talked a little bit about operations and technology maintenance type projects. Again, these are things that are important to us. These are things that you'll see in the plan. These are things that you'll see in the financial plan, but they're not necessarily things that you would see um, potentially as uh, individual projects identified in the plan the same way that you would see some of those other major projects. Um, we talked a lot about this slide last week, our, our policy framework and desired outcomes. Um, again, a reminder here, this is really the framework um, that we're looking at. This takes together all of the sort of major regional plans that have been done. This was the, really the foundation for how we develop scenarios. Um, it's the foundation for how we're proposing to move forward. The collection of all of this work by all of these agencies really does represent uh, the region's needs, vision, desires, priorities, et cetera. One of the specific things that we talked about last Monday uh, was the notion of how local government plans and studies fit into this. Um, we were asked to, and we have specifically acknowledged here um, on this slide, as you see, uh, the local transportation plans, the comprehensive plans, uh, the other plans that are done at sort of the county level um, and the local government level. Um, so you asked for that explicit acknowledge acknowledgement. Always been part of the framework, but I think it was a good comment. Let's just show that. Let's make that explicitly clear. Let's also remember that for all of these other agencies, but particularly Dr. Cog, the plans that we do, the work that we do, you know, it's, it's a little cliche, but we are you and you are us in the sense that all of these plans that we have done um, have had extensive, you know, local input, uh, local involvement. So really, you know, that local sort of local perspective is carried forward in all of the work that Dr. Cog does and probably some of these other agencies as well and some of these specific plans. But again, we did want to specifically acknowledge uh, the local plans that are out there as well. Um, Maybe one more slide here and then maybe we'll pause for some initial questions, but again, just some review from last time, sort of the general process that we talked about. Um, and I think there's some general comfort with how we proceed forward um, as a reminder of what we talked about last week, kind of a dual track here that on the one hand, um, and we'll get into this more in a couple of slides about the role of the County Transportation Forum um, in soliciting projects. Um, so it's kind of one track that we're working with all of you um, at the same time in a parallel track Dr. Cog will be working with CDOT uh, and RTD um, to sort of look at those major regional projects, those regional plans um, that I just showed you and kind of working uh, in a work session format with those, you know, our partner agencies to kind of work through some of those things. And then as we start, you know, working through both of those uh, dual tracks, identifying uh, priorities, identifying specific projects, you know, bringing those together in the interagency coordination process, uh, coming up with draft program and project priorities. Uh, the second blue box that you see. Um, at the same time, we're still working on the financial plan. Uh, we're bringing all of that together then um, to come up with those draft priorities and then working through TAC, RTC, and the board uh, to review that work. And then the final box at the bottom, uh, final program and project investment priorities to create the 2050 regional transportation plan. So Mr. Chair, I do have a few more slides, but let me just kind of pause there for uh, some initial questions if there are any. It, just a reminder, if you have a question, please raise your hand and um, Jacob or Melinda will call on you. 
do we have any raised hands? Uh, I am not seeing any yet, but obviously we can give everyone just a few moments, just in case. Okay, I'm not seeing any. So, Jacob and Mr. Chair. Let's go okay. ahead and proceed, Jacob. Okay. Um, let's keep going. This is a little more detail um, on that process that, that I just talked about. Um, and again, we talked about this last week, but just to show this a little bit more detail. Um, on the left-hand side, sort of the county transportation forum um, piece of the dual track. Uh, we talked about local project sponsors submitting to the county forums. We're going to talk about that more in a couple slides. Uh, the county forums will prioritize uh, sub-regional candidate projects to submit for evaluation. And then sort of in the middle or kind of on the right-hand side of the orange slide, again, Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, working together on sort of those regional plans, regional projects, identifying those priorities. Um, and then uh, the three agencies prioritizing some regional candidate projects. And then again, bringing those dual track processes together. Um, into an evaluation committee that includes all of the partner agencies and includes representatives uh, from each of the county transportation forums um, to kind of sift through and evaluate all the candidate projects. And then uh, working together um, over on the right, the interagency coordination to determine all investment priorities for the 2050 plan. Um, talking about the uh, county transportation forums a little bit, we talked about this last Monday of, um, you know, project submittals. A uh, couple points I'd make here. Um, one is let's keep in mind the sort of big picture point that Ron made last week, which is that, you know, understand, and we specifically noted that here, um, this is not a guarantee of number of projects in the plan. This is, this is not the tip. Um, this is not what this is. This is more about um, candidate projects for submittal, uh, for evaluation, for potential inclusion in the final fiscally constrained plan. Um, but again, given revenues, uh, given priorities, you know, we're not going to include 115 candidate projects in the plan. I know we won't have enough revenue to do that. Um, this is again about, you know, projects to submit, candidate projects to submit for evaluation. So that's one key point I want us to keep in mind. Um, the other point, we had a question on this slide last Monday about um, reminder, this is based on uh, what we just went through on the tip in terms of the uh, tip uh, shares by um, by county subregion uh, based on population employment and DM team. We had a question here about um, since these shares were calculated for the tip process and that's close to a couple of years old now. Um, would these look much different if they were updated with more current uh, current data? Um, we didn't run the numbers, but we did go back and look at what we used. Um, and honestly, I don't think these would change either at all. Or if they did, it would literally change maybe one project. Um, again, keep in mind here that um, depending, this is about, you know, each county or each subregion portion of the regional share. Uh, so as that reminder, Adams County, for example, is about 15% of the region. Um, so we're thinking 15 submittals from the Adams County Forum, just as an easy way to explain it. If we did update these numbers, um, again, since we're talking about proportion of total regional share, um, one or two forums might gain a project, maybe one or two forums might lose a project. So we would suggest rather than, than going through that, um, hopefully folks would be comfortable just what was used in the TIP process. It should still be pretty accurate as a way to move forward. Um, so let's get into a little bit, and this, is, uh, this was attached to the uh, memo, uh, the packet for this item. Uh, we wanted to give everyone kind of a sense when we talk about soliciting projects and talk about evaluating projects, we wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of what does that actually look like rather than just talking about it in concept. We wanted to give you some information so you could start to see specifically what we think, um, you know, that would look like in terms of what we're asking folks to submit, how would we evaluate these projects, et cetera. So the attachment in the packet, and I can pull that up if we want to go through it in that level of detail. But this slide kind of summarizes some of the basic things that we would ask about in terms of a project. Uh, many of these I won't go through because they should be pretty self-evident. Um, you know, want folks to explain a little bit um, about how this project responds to the primary objectives um, within MetroVision. Uh, we outlined those in the attachment. We also outlined the uh, federal FAST Act performance-based planning requirements that we're, uh, that we're obligated to use in this process. 
Many of them uh, sort of coexist with the Metro Vision objectives. So as we noted in the attachment, we would actually combine some of those. Like for example, safety is one that shows up in both. Uh, so we would combine those to make it easier for, uh, for folks to respond. But the idea is that, again, this is not the tip. Uh, we're not meaning to make this a very, you know, lengthy bureaucratic process. Um, but we do want to get a sense of how, you know, how a proposed candidate project would generally respond qualitatively, quantitatively, you know, however a project sponsor felt appropriate, how would, how would a proposed project respond to or address uh, some of the Metro Vision and some of the Fast Act uh, performance uh, criteria. We recognize that not every project is going to address every single thing. That's okay. What we're looking for, though, obviously, is projects that can tick more, more of the boxes than, um, than not. You know, if you've got a project that can address, you know, three or four or five things, that's probably a stronger project. Uh, so again, Mr. Chair, let me kind of pause there and, and take some questions if there are any. So if you have some questions, please raise your hand and we'll call on you. All right, Mr. Chair, it does look like we do have our first question or comment from Art Griffith. So Art, go ahead. Um, can you just kind of explain a little bit more about the timeline for the sub-regions to shortlist, let's say, down to their top 10 projects, at least for Douglas County? Like, that could be quite an effort. And I'm wondering if that would take <laughs> more than two months for us to get there. Yeah, thanks, Art. I actually have that coming up in one or two slides, um, so I will explain that, yes. Um, that is one thing that we do want to talk about today is kind of that process, as the bottom bullet says here, um, how the sub-regional forums will prioritize submittals and forward to Dr. Cog. Um, so that is a discussion point that we do want to get to today. I think I've got a couple more slides, and then let's come back to that. Are there any other questions, Melinda, so far? Uh, I am not seeing any other hands raised right now. So I I do have one for you um, on, on this, Jacob, is do we want to limit how long the narrative is? I mean, are you, you know, it could be a paragraph or it could be a thousand pages for each question answered. Yeah. And that may generate some discussion from the rest of the group. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, if we could, Mr. Chair, that's a good question. Let's hold on to that just a second, because uh, I think the next slide starts getting into that process just a little bit. That'd be fine. Okay. All right. I'm going to go on to the next slide. Jacob, we did have um, another hand go up. Oh, uh, we did oh, have another okay. hand go up. Uh, are, you, are you prepared to take another comment or question? Sure. Perfect. Okay. Looks like it is from uh, Brian Weimer. So Brian, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. So my question is relative to the proposed implementation timeline. I'm, I'm assuming that's from an air quality perspective, but um, you know, that could be a function of also dollars available. What type of priority are you looking at in terms of uh, implementation timeline and criteria that we should be using thinking about that. Uh, let me think about that, Brian, make sure I understand your question. And again, my last slide is the proposed schedule, so uh, we will talk about that. Um, the schedule in part, yes, is driven by air quality conformity requirements. We do need to get to a point where we've identified um, those draft sort of roadway and rapid transit networks that we model for air quality conformity as part of putting the plan together. Um, but I think there was more okay, to your Jacob. question. Could you? Jacob, this is Ron. Yeah. Could, I, I, yeah. think, I think Brian's question was a little different. Brian, can, can you confirm that your question was about um, the project information that's provided about the proposed implementation time frame, timeline for that project? That is correct. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Sorry, I misunderstood that. Yeah, all we're looking for there, we recognize that, um, you know, a lot of these projects, particularly when we're looking, you know, 20, 25, 30 years out, you know, pretty conceptual. 
Um, but again, to do that air quality component modeling that I just talked about, we do need to have a sense of generally within, you know, what we call air quality staging periods or 10 or five year staging periods when that project is anticipated to come online. Um, so what we're looking for there is that estimate of which staging period uh, a project would fall into. And those are articulated on the attachment we list those, those draft staging periods. And this is Ron, um, if I could just um, add a little bit uh, to that, that's, that's entirely correct. I think the point here is we want a sense from the, from the project proponent or this or um, the pro potential project sponsor about um, their sense of the, the timeline for the need uh, for the project, realizing that this is a 30 year plan and um, based on available financial resources, um, not every project is gonna be able to be implemented in the first 10 years of the 30 year plan, but we do want an indication um, from the from the proponents of the project about the when they when they think the project um, should come online when it would when it should be completed sort of relative to the need for the project and obviously a big a big discussion um, with everyone uh, once there's agreement on sort of the priorities is figuring out sort of how we can prioritize those priorities within some logical chunks of time during the 30 years of the plan period. And it's almost a, it's kind of a chicken and an egg to a certain extent in terms of what type of growth you may have, what type of external forces that are driving the project, which we may not have all that information at the time of presenting the project. And some of that comes in in terms of you modeling, correct? Um, in terms of priorities and what you're looking for. Yeah, and I would suggest that, you know, a lot of local jurisdictions also have local transportation plans where a lot of these priorities have already been identified to some degree. And, and most most local jurisdictions should have some ideas about when particular improvements might be necessary within that 30 year time period, knowing that, you know, things can, things can change, Brian, certainly. Um, that's why we update that's why we update the long range plan every four years is to so that we're you know constantly adjusting and adapting to to situations as they occur um we ought to we ought to be pretty right about what our immediate priorities are say the next you know the next 10 uh years or so and you know we can afford to be slightly less right sort of than the 20 10 to 20 year time frame and we can afford to probably be even less right sort of the last 10 years of the plan but we ought to generally have some agreement about what the overall priorities are brian does that answer your question yeah let's that, that helps thank you okay. I think it's important what Ron said there is that, you know, this is a plan and we do update it usually every year or two as far as timelines. We have one that just went through or here on E470. So, yeah, and I, I don't think that even when we got into the tip, that if it wasn't within the most current um, staging, that there was always flexibility within that from a Air quality perspective as well. Okay. So with that, are there any other hands raised? Uh, yes, actually, we did have another hand go up uh, from Art Griffith. So Art, go ahead. Yes. Um, so what about these projects, these major projects in the subregion? that may or may not be on a state highway because we don't really have that much control over um, what CDOT will submit because they have a limited number of projects to submit too. So some of our project priorities for regional would likely be on state highways. Um, so that makes it difficult from a planning perspective to determine what year it would be, um, you know, given certain budgets. So, I mean, CDOT's got a a 10-year pipeline, but really before COVID, they were only focusing on the next four years as the ones, and even that next four years is in jeopardy because of COVID. So 
I know this is a long range plan, but I have no idea um, how that fits with CDOT's funding if the re regional project is on their facility. Can you advise? Yeah, Art, I think there's a couple things to that, at least a couple things. One is that in this first sort of step, we, you know, we just want to, we just want to determine the priorities. And in fact, let me, let me kind of come back to this slide. So in this, and that's kind of the beauty of the dual track process that we want to hear, we want to hear the priorities for the sub-regional forums, and we want to hear uh, from our work with RTD and CDOT. So the first step is, let's just hear what those priorities are. And if the sub-region you know, has priorities on the state highway system, well, let's hear that. Um, then as we work through and we bring these, these dual tracks together, and we're working on the financial plan and all the other inputs, then in that second step is where we can start figuring out, okay, once we know uh, or we think we know what some of these priorities are, then as Ron just alluded to, let's kind of figure out, you know, where do things start slotting in both on sort of logical sequencing of within our staging periods, um, the revenue picture, COVID, whatever else, you know, let's figure out how that, how that gets staged and how that gets constructed for the plan. Art, did that kind of help? Kind of. Um, it, it doesn't help on the detail of the, I mean, I like the system, so you'll be able to capture both, but at the same time, um, I would imagine a lot of us have similar needs on state highways. I don't care if they're state highways, 85s or 119 or 7 or 93 or 36 or, you know, um, anyway. There's so many of these CDOT roads that we're interdependent on for success. And um, um, it's a partnering thing. And I don't know how quick we can pull that information together with them, given their limitations on the number of projects that they can submit as well. So just to, just to clarify, based on sort of the feedback from CDOT and the um, kind of this, um, the revision to the proposal that we unveiled uh, last Monday. Uh, we're not putting a limit on CDOT. We're we're going to develop. We're going to work through this cooperative process between Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD on sort of on uh, the the regional priorities through that um, through that process of the um, developing the regional candidate projects together. So we're not we're not putting a limit on the sort of number of projects the CDOT brings forward. They've done a lot of planning work to identify priorities um, and um, the priority considerations through the statewide plan and the 10-year development program. Um, so we're not limiting that. We're, we're, having a, we're having a conversation together uh, looking at those priorities. And um, maybe Paul will want to weigh in on this, but I would assume that most of the, uh, when the forums meet, that CDOT will be present at those uh, sub-regional forums. The, uh, this is Paul, I had my hand up there, but um, just to respond back to a couple of these questions. Um, you know, right now, um, this whole process is under review at CDOT, so we're trying to come to terms with exactly what this means for us. And so we're still um, some meetings away with Dr. Cog and with executive leadership at CDOT to, uh, you know, just think some more about this process. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Art, did you have any more? comment on this then? Don't hold your breath. I'm sure I'll come up with some as the meeting goes on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Jacob. Uh, okay. or, Shall I continue? Other, yeah, or, or Melinda, are there any other hands up? Uh, we do have uh, a couple more hands raised, uh, and we did have a suggestion in the suggestion box from Deborah Basket uh, to potentially maybe move on and hear the remainder of the presentation, but obviously I leave that to you and Jacob. So how many? Well, Mr. Chair, go ahead. Yeah, if we do have a couple of questions, I don't mind taking them now. Okay, let's go ahead okay. and take them now. Perfect. All right. Then our next question or comment is from Eileen Yazzie. So Eileen, go ahead. 
Yeah, sure. Um, kind of going to what um, Art was talking about, about a little bit of this, of kind of, uh, I don't want to say who goes first or how are we supposed to know how the local agencies and the sub-regional forums supposed to know what CDOT's doing and, you know, looking at the long range plan. My question is, it's actually related to this slide, is I think it might be helpful or is it possible? So I know it just looks this way, is that the tracks, the two tracks start at the same time. Is it possible to the to do the CDOT, Dr. Cog, RTV, oh, RTV, RTD um, vision and needs prior to the sub forums? I think kind of to give us almost that base layer of the transit and highway kind of you know outlined needs their vision and needs so that then we can either we can support those um priorities and or connect into them i i think that could be really helpful in helping the sub regions work with kind of from that regional perspective with the with the dot and rtd is that is that possible yeah, I mean, so kind of in a nutshell here, yes. Um, in a sense, we've already begun those conversations. Um, as Paul alluded to, we've been um, kind of working with CDOT, um, stepping through with them what this process would look like and the implications for CDOT, um, having those conversations. We've been working with RTD, um, you know, a lot of coordination between the 2050 plan um, and RTD's reimagined process. So in a sense, those conversations have already started. And yes, that would be that would be our notion that um, assuming that there's sort of general comfort overall with with this framework of a process that yes we would uh, we would be working with um, CDOT and RTD more formally uh, over the next you know month and a half couple months um, while while the sub regional stuff you know because we would need to um, if TAC at, at your June 22nd meeting kind of endorses this we do need to take it to RTC and the board in July um, and so when we get the sub regional forums engaged you know we're looking at like late July. Um, so yes, we certainly hope by late July that uh, we've already done a fair amount of this groundwork with C with CDOT and RTD. Okay, so then hopefully we would have again kind of almost a a little bit of a I don't want to say a base network, but again kind of we would have the 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 needs outlined by CDOT and RTD, you know, visually or or you know in a laundry list or whatever of what their kind of proposals are so that we can again connect into and or respond? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll say, and I'll, um, I'll ask Ron to kind of help with this, but let me give my take on that. We we don't want folks working across purposes for sure. Um, and that's part of our job at Dr. Cog is to coordinate all of this and, and help folks to work together. Um, but that said, we don't want the forums to feel, you know, constrained is too strong a word, but we, we want to hear sort of independently from the forums you know, what your priorities are. Um, and part of the beauty of this dual track process is that, you know, we can take that information and coordinate that with RTD and CDOT um, together so that all these things come together um, in a way that makes sense for everyone as, as we step through it. Um, but we don't want, we don't want, I don't think, to have the forms kind of start from a base that sort of feels limiting of like, this is all you get from the other agencies. We want to hear, you know, the point of this is that we, we want to work collaboratively with CDOT and RTD and we want to work collaboratively with the forums, and then we want to take what we hear from each of those and bring them together. Okay, I, I, I understand that. I am. I, I just feel as if I think that relates to, you know, looking at the system as a whole. And I'll just, I'll, I'll just kind of target um, transit right now. Is like, so if an R, if RTD's plan is to say that they want, you know, 10 minute frequency on X percent of their network or whatever, or a certain amount of coverage. I think it would be really good for the cities and the counties and the subregions to know that information before they start, you know, mixing up their own recipe and their own, own suggestions. That's what I'm thinking, you know? So I think that that just goes back with like, that's where I feel like could be super helpful for us to understand kind of those those on get get that network understanding and for us to work together. Yeah, and I appreciate that, Eileen. And I think what I'd say, I've come back to this slide of the framework slide. I think every single thing on this slide, just just about every single thing on this slide, are things that 
well, most of them, not every single thing, but many of them, most of them are things that are done, complete, um, otherwise known to some level of detail. And I would suggest that, you know, this is our starting point. It's not our limiting point. There will be things that come through um, as we work together. But all of these plans, all of these things that you see here are things that, for example, you know, RTD's regional BRT study, that's a known quantity. Um, CDOT's program of 10-year um, pipeline of projects, that's a known quantity. So I think in large part, we all have that base from the work that we've all done together uh, to start that conversation. Okay. Will, um, will Dr. Cog um, be able to kind of almost be a little bit of a hub for these documents? Um, so I know like CDOT has, I'm pretty familiar with all of RTDs and where to get that information, but like the 10-year st strategic projects, I mean, is it, will you guys kind of give all of us collectively on this slide a hub of that information to use? Yes. Great. Thank you. Eileen, did you have any further questions on that? I don't. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Melinda, who else had their hand raised? Uh, thank you. We have, it looks like our next uh, question or comment will be from Mac Callison. Mac, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Melinda. Mac Callison, City of Aurora. I'd still, Jacob, I'd still like to, and I believe we all would, uh, have some additional clarity or further clarity in terms of the relationship. If you could bring up that dual track uh, graph that you had earlier on. And I, I, I guess what's raising, uh, raising interest and, and question uh, for myself. Um, would be the relationship, uh, let's look at the theme of collaborative and cooperative uh, between local jurisdictions and in this case, the agency CDOT, uh, particularly for state highway uh, projects and programs. And that relationship, uh, which has been cultivated in 2035, 2040, and presumably 2050 uh, regionally uh, transportation plans, it, it's not clear with this graphic how that relationship is developed um, uh, and furthered and updated uh, into the into this 2050 process we're going through. It looks like we're making a, a clear and concise uh, 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 difference in partitioning the local uh, agencies, local jurisdictions, cities and counties, and then agencies, COG, CDOT, RTD, respectively. So if you could help with that. Uh, so actually, Ron, I'm going to ask you, to, uh, <laughs> do you have a thought on that? Sure. Um, Mac, I think, you know, it's intentional it's intentional the way this is crafted because there are there are some differences and i think we want to hear through the sub-regional forum processes sort of priority investments within those areas um, we also know that there's been input that's been provided to cdot from local jurisdictions through our joint conversations through the 4p process and um, and otherwise um, so I think some of that has happened. Keep in mind that, you know, the MPO and Dr. Cog is, is all of you, um, you know, and so it's not like we don't collectively sort of have a fairly good sense of what everyone's um, um, vision and needs are as they've been expressed and as we're trying to capture here and everyone should be considering as we develop um, priorities together. But there is an important interagency coordination process that is essential to, to, to this. Um, that is um, the three primary partners in the, uh, in the regional transportation planning process, CDOT, RTD, and Dr. Cog, together sort of identifying sort of those, those uh, major priorities. And we bring that all together through this process. So there is a need, and to get to Eileen's point too, there is some need to have some parallel work going on, but it doesn't mean nobody's talking to each other as those parallel processes are, are occurring. And ultimately, 
it all gets brought together as we develop um, draft program of project and in investment priorities taken into account um, all the priorities that everyone has expressed and our financial resources um, and ultimately um, gets reviewed and weighed in by TAC, RTC, and the board before we finalize that draft. Yeah, I appreciate that, Ron. You know, I'm I'm looking at the graphic and and uh, while we have a a, a transverse or a, a lateral, if you will, uh, meeting at at the in the middle there from the county forms on one side and RTD prioritized regional candidate projects coming down to the evaluation committee. Um, I think as as we talked and as as you uh, as you mentioned just just now we have some back and forth some really connections between starting at the first between rtd and, and cdot in this case and local jurisdiction for for projects um uh and and also in the county forums so um, what we look forward to continue that cooperative continuing and uh, uh process yeah thanks mac and i you know i i Absolute credit to to CDOT and RTD for how engaged they've been uh, with Dr. Cog and all of you in the in those forums, and I think you know that's that's where those discussions um, rightly occur. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Mac. Did you have any more questions, Mac? Uh, we're good for at this moment. Okay. Were there any other hands raised, Melinda? Uh, yes, we have a couple more. Um, looks like our next question or comment will be from Tim Kirby. So, Tim, go ahead. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, so Ron and Jacob, question for you. I'm having a hard time telling from uh, what's been presented so far. Are we still talking about um, Dr. T Dr. Cog combining their revenues with what has traditionally been CDOT sources? As, as, you, as you're aware, Tim, uh, the metropolitan planning process deals with all available resources um, to be invested and um, prioritized within the context of a long-range regional transportation plan. So yes, this is, this is all-encompassing of um, all available resources um, that are invested or identified for potential uh, investment through the 30-year regional transportation plan. Thanks for that, Ron. And then, and, and I did want to clarify just because I had a hard time telling from the presentation. So thanks for that. So uh, just a quick statement. I would say, you know, CDOT still remains very uncomfortable with, you know, kind of our traditional sources being turned over to the Dr. Cog decision making and voting process. So, you know, any proposal that, that says that CDOT is going to be very concerned about that. I would say, though, you know, we as CDOT are, you know, we look forward to you know, any increase to what we consider an already robust collaborative um, collaborative process, any increase to that, which, you know, where we can see opportunities to improve improve that, you know, collaborations beyond what we, we do now, we very much look forward to that. So just just wanted to go on record and be very pointed with that to make sure that, that CDOT's position is clearly stated. So thanks, Ron. Thank you, Tim. Uh, do we... Tim, can, Mr. Chair, could I just speak sure. to that? And, and maybe I'll just wait for Paul and Rebecca to weigh in first before I jump in. Okay. I see their hands are up. Okay, okay. I'll go ahead and mute both of them. Uh, so either one of them should be able to speak. Hey, uh, this is Paul. Um, I just wanted to um, echo Tim's comments. I mean, I think, uh, as I said earlier, we are still evaluating exactly what this process looks like and the impact of CDOT. Although, you know, historically there has been a element of CDOT controlled funding and Dr. Cog controlled funding and CDOT is still very interested in having control over what we've historically viewed as our funding. And there's a lot of reasons for that I won't get into, but I did want to address um, Art, uh, Max, uh, Eileen's um, good comments as well. You know, um, with respect to those CDOT controlled funds, I don't actually expect a whole lot of surprise there. Um, CDOT, CDOT over the last couple of years, we had a 4P process two years ago, and then this last year, it seems like my whole year was devoted to planning or certainly a good part of it 
went and spoke to all eight counties. We got a lot of letters from our um, local agencies. We formed a list, um, both the uh, four-year list, which we were hoping would be funded by Senate Bill 267 dollars. Those first two years have been um, uh, done, and now we're uh, we're still hoping years three and four follow through. But then that uh, years five through ten, you know, that was never um, funded projects. We had a billion dollars worth of unfunded in that list, and then we um, had below the line four billion additional dollars. And um, and so as as Tim said, I just wanted to reiterate we're very interested in um, having a robust planning process, increasing our relationship with Dr. Cog and how we talk through all those many projects, but we still do very much have concerns about uh, what that means in terms of uh, how those projects are selected. Thank you. And this is Rebecca White with CDOT. I'm afraid we're starting to repeat ourselves, but I just I want to say that again. It's not just concern CDOT has with this. I would probably say it's it's pretty strong opposition to um, the way this is framed up, at least as we understand it now. Uh, and it, it's not an opposition at all to collaboration. That's I think we have a great relationship with Dr. Cog and and come to some really good outcomes. Um, including the, the program we're about to uh, announce next week or soon here on, on urban arterial safety. Um, but we, you know, there's a, a situation here where CDOT absolutely has to have some autonomy and dollars that we receive and have an obligation to spend according to um, what our transportation commission and our executive director asked us to do. So to my to my friends at CDOT and everyone on the call, I, you know I'm I'm disappointed to hear this after we've had, um, you know we've we've really tried to be responsive to CDOT's concerns and develop a develop a process here that respects um, the CDOT perspective and your priorities and and will accommodate those, um, but also respects um, our planning agreement between all the jurisdictions. Um, and federal law and regulations about developing a long-range regional plan and i guess you know just to be crystal clear i've expressed this to you very clearly um, this is a plan it's not a tip uh, we're not trying to dictate to cdot how you spend what you consider your money um, but we are trying to develop um, what the right set of priorities are for this region through a collaborative process and a collaborative process is not CDOT giving the region a list of its priorities and saying, here's our projects, put them in the plan. Um, that's, that's not a collaborative process. Uh, we think this interagency coordination process with input from the sub-regional forums is a collaborative process. Any uh, other hands raised, Belinda? Uh, I am not seeing any at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay. Jacob, if you will continue on your forward. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, few more slides here. Let's talk a little bit about um, candidate project evaluation. Um, so as we talked about in the last, uh, we talked about a lot last week and, and I think before um, of the flow chart that we've been talking about the last several minutes, we have an evaluation committee. Uh, made up of representatives of the three partner agencies, uh, Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD, um, as well as representatives from each of the uh, county subregion uh, transportation forums. We've also talked about um, this notion of how we evaluate projects. Uh, we have proposed, and I think you know, have general concurrence on the notion that this would be a qualitative evaluation. One of the things that we maybe wanted to talk in a little more detail today is a little bit more of what that might look like. Um, and so I've got a slide on that in a second. Um, and then as we've talked about, the evaluation will be combined with the draft financial plan, um, all the coordination, everything that we've talked about up to this point, uh, that all comes together to determine the draft program and project investment priorities. So um, as, is, as we've talked about in the last couple uh, meetings together and as demonstrated in uh, the attachment to this item, one of the key sort of ways that we're proposing that we do that qualitative evaluation somewhat similar to the TIF, but you know, looking at Metro Vision Plan objectives, um, 
one of the things we've talked about in the last couple of sessions is, you know, the number of, of objectives that, that we're asking folks to sort of take a look at. Uh, we've come back and we've streamlined this a little bit to focus on um, about 10 of the primary uh, objectives within the Metro Vision Plan. Um, at one point, I think we were looking at more like 20 or 30 because we were trying to find, you know, all of those transportation, you know, primary and supporting objectives, anything that might seem relevant. Uh, one of the things we heard from you is let's let's be a little more strategic about that. Let's let's sort of limit the universe on that just a little bit. So we're proposing 10 of the primary Metro Vision um, objectives, and we think that will actually help in the sense that at that level, they're pretty flexible and they're pretty all-encompassing. So um, it's clear sort of what they're looking for, but it also gives some room to uh, for each project to kind of respond of how they address um, each of those criteria. So I'm not going to go through them individually on this slide, but you can see them listed here by theme um, or chapter within MetroVision. And then we also sort of started a notion of what a qualitative evaluation might look like. You know, some might be high, medium, low, some might be yes or no. Uh, one of the things that we talked about last week was you know, if we're doing somewhat like the tip where, you know, we're doing a, um, a high, medium, low type of evaluation, is that a, a one through three, a one through four type of scale? Um, don't know if we want to get into that level of detail today, but that's sort of the notion there of, of again, that assessment of qualitative assessment of how a project uh, lines up with the Metro Vision objectives. And then also on that attachment, as I noted earlier, is the FAST Act uh, transportation performance management uh, criteria. Um, that we are obligated to use in this process. That's federal requirement um, to do that as part of a long-range plan. But as I said, many of those, probably even most of them, already line up in some way uh, with the primary objectives in MetroVision. So when this comes time to actually do this and we send you a application form, is probably a little stronger word, but when we send out the kind of final form, we'll combine those together to, to make that as streamlined and easy as possible so that you're not writing about safety two or three different times or you're not writing about a different topic several times. Um, so I think this is the last slide, but we've had some questions on this, so let's talk through this as well, uh, sort of the schedule that we think we're looking at. Um, bottom line is that we think we need to get to our board by October um, with those draft priorities identified um, so that we can, um, we can identify what those um, uh, regionally significant roadway capacity and rapid transit model networks are. Uh, so that we have endorsement of those by the board so that we can get into air quality conformity uh, modeling uh, later this fall. So how do we get there? Um, the notion here is that uh, based on all the work that we've done together over the last several meetings, we're going to bring back to you next week at your regular meeting on June 22nd, um, sort of wrap this all into a complete package, um, asking you to endorse or approve that. Um, everything we've talked about in terms of solicitation, evaluation, framework for next steps on 2015. Uh, bring that to RTC and the board in July uh, for their uh, their endorsement. And then um, assuming we get there, um, then we'd reach out to the forums after mid-July to solicit those sub-regional priorities, um, as was alluded to in a previous question. Um, by then, we're already having those conversations, the interagency coordination with RTC and CDOT, uh, still continuing to work on the financial plan as we get into August. Um, then through August into between August to September, uh, evaluating uh, those draft investment priorities, uh, that dual track process, bringing that together um, to come up with those draft list of um, draft list of priorities, and then in September at the September TAC bring, meeting, bringing that to you uh, for your endorsement of those networks to model, and then bringing that to RTC and the board in October. Uh, so with that, that actually is the last slide, um, and again I'll pause, Mr. Chair, for some questions. Are there uh, questions for Jacob, either on the plan objectives, um, measurements, or the timeline? Uh, it looks like we had a hand go up from Art Griffith. So, Art, go ahead. Um, I want to go back to a request, and I, I don't remember um, who made it there, um, but um, it was following up to my comment. I, I really think that in order to meet this schedule, we need a baseline or foundation of what CDOT and RTD are thinking in that slide that shows us all working together that we took some time going over. But if we don't have a starting point to even dialogue with them, um, you know, at most I'm going to be able to have 
a sub-regional meeting every month, even though we're kind of scheduled for every other month. But without knowing at least the baseline from RTD and CDOT, which would include Bustang elements and other mobility hub things, because we're looking way out to 2050, um, I don't know how we bring this all together. So um, I'm going to echo that request to get what I call the baseline information um, in advance of me going to set up my sub-regionals. And I could ask others their opinion if I could, Mr. Chair, if they could weigh in on that. Yeah, let's let's discuss let's further discuss that then. And are there any other hands raised for that specific comment? Uh, we'll give everyone just a second, just in case they'd like to weigh in. Uh, we do have a hand that went up um, from Paul DeSatis. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, um, Art, to your question, um, message received. Uh, let us go back and uh, consider that. And I think that was really the same question that Mac and Eileen had as well. So good question, and um, I'll get back to you on it. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, and, and Art, this is Ron, if I could. You know, I think certainly, uh, I don't think CDOT would argue with the point that, you know, the work that they've done um, to develop the 10-year um, program or projects is as good a baseline at this point as there is from them. Um, and then what other, uh, whatever other information they might want to provide. Okay. That answer your question, Art? Yeah, that, that answers my question, um, though the 10 year is not the same thing as a 2050 year plan. So it's kind of like what's over the rainbow beyond the 10 year that interests me the most if we're working on a 2050 plan. Okay. Which is yeah. which, which art is why which which is why we're proposing this framework and that interagency um, that interagency process to to look beyond that 10 year list of projects to to identify priorities for the entire 30 years of the of the plan period and i think we all I would agree i would agree we all, Ron. we all need to acknowledge that you know really the the first four or five years of the of the plan is is pretty well fixed um through through the investment decisions that have been made by dr cog and rtd um and cdot in the in the tip and the and the step Okay, thank you, Ron and Art. Do we have other hands raised? Uh, yes, we do. It looks like uh, Rebecca White uh, I has a question or comment. Rebecca, go ahead. Uh, sure, a comment and then a question. I mean, I will I will note on the long-term planning discussion, while CDOT has put a lot of focus on our 10-year vision and that sort of tangible list of projects, we also have our, our own state and federal planning requirements that um, ask us to look out for the long term. And in fact, right now we do have a 2045 plan out. Um, it does not list specific projects. I don't, um, that's just, we don't think there's a, a lot of value in trying to pick what we might build precisely in 2045, but it does articulate our priorities and what we want to achieve for the state. And we'd be glad to talk more about that. The question I have is, uh, when does this presentation and concept start to go in draft form to the full Dr. Cog board? I don't think I, I heard that from Jacob if he mentioned it. I just see it kind of at the end. Jacob. So I, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so Rebecca, if you're, if you're asking when these ideas we've been talking about the last couple of TAC work sessions, when does that go to the board? Um, yes. yes, I did mention that that would go in July. Okay. So the intention, let me go over that part of the schedule again, that uh, based on all the conversations we've had um, over the last month or so, uh, we'll wrap that all up and bring that to TAC for endorsement or approval um, at your regular meeting next week on the 22nd, and then bring that to RTC and board in July for their endorsement or approval. Okay. Does that answer your question, Rebecca? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Chair, this is Ron. I did want to address yeah. part of Rebecca's comment there. I mean, Rebecca, um, with all due respect, um, CDOT doesn't adopt 
a list of projects for the statewide 2045 plan because they're not required to. Um, Dr. Cog as an MPO, like all the other MPOs in the state, is required to adopt a plan with specific projects um, identified um, in the plan for the entire plan horizon. Um, that, is, that is the metropolitan planning process. I would encourage you to read through the federal regs and the federal law, um, as well as our transportation planning in the Denver region and our metropolitan planning agreement between the three agencies that lays out how we develop a regional transportation plan. Um, they are different processes. And as a matter of fact, state law stipulates that regional plans get incorporated into the statewide transportation plan, um, not that the regional plans incorporate uh, directly the, the statewide transportation plan. Um, fully acknowledge that the planning framework that the state does, the statewide plan, is an incredibly important part of the framework for us together developing the regional transportation plan um, like all of the other inputs and so i'm not we're not suggesting ignoring that or dismissing it or um, downplaying that because it is an, an incredibly important part of the policy framework and developing the vision and needs and an important role for cdot in this process is to provide guidance to us about state regulations and the transportation commission's investment priorities um, and and the plan preparation. That's a really important role and we want that incorporated. And we feel like the framework that we've developed acknowledges um, all of our all of our roles in that process. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Um, Melinda, do, do we have any other hands raised? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we do. It looks like we have an additional comment or question from Eileen Yazzie. So Eileen, go ahead. Hey, um, a, a few things. One, and I meant to send an email out after last Monday's meeting. Is it possible, um, and after today in this presentation, is it possible for uh, Dr. Cog to send out these presentations to the, um, to the TAC, the one last Monday and today? Um, or maybe I, maybe I don't know. Um, webex that well and maybe or maybe i can just download it is it possible to send these out yeah it is eileen and in fact like this presentation was actually part of the packet oh okay good i obviously yeah. told you you can tell i i read the packet beforehand um no no worries yeah that information is either already available or we'll make is, it available okay thank you the other question i have here is kind of this time frame and related to collaboration um i i am curious if we if if we and it's the collective we feel comfortable with like a two month or a month collaboration process that's i'm i'm struggling with that a little bit um from my, my own past experience um and then also just knowing that our workload, I mean, and I'm talking personally about Denver's workload this summer with its continued, you know, ongoing work um, like construction and planning efforts and then prepping for the 2050 plan and then looking for that collaboration. And I understand that there's that determine interagency priorities, but I actually still feel like there's almost like this iterative process that would need to happen between when when uh, projects, proposed projects come in from all of us, I would, I feel like there needs to be, you know, cause you're, you were putting that we're modeling a network as of September, you know, that's, it, it seems like we may need more of an iterative process. Um, and if, if it does take longer than this, is there something at risk? So thanks for your questions. I mean, let me answer that in a couple of ways. Let me kind of start with the schedule, and then I think we also need to talk a little bit about the role of the forums um, in this process. When it comes to the schedule that we're showing on this slide, the reason for the schedule is bottom line, we do have a federal deadline for when we adopt this plan that we cannot change, and that just, it is what it is. We have to have this plan adopted by uh, spring of 2021. And when you work backwards through um, the, the public comment review period, the public hearing, you know, all those steps that we all have to go through um, on, on processes like this, 
if we're not if we're not bringing to some if we're not bringing this to the board by about October, um, we're frankly in danger of not being able to meet that deadline. So that's just it really is what it is. Having said that, um, what we're looking for is sort of the most collaborative, but also the most streamlined way in which we get from here to there um, to be able to meet the schedule. And specifically when it comes to the role of the forums, one of the things I want to say here, and I think this is worth some conversation, is that um, we're sort of seeing the, the forums as kind of the fulcrum for um, projects, you know, candidate project submittals from local governments. And contrast that with what we did six years ago when we developed the 2040 uh, Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, really the 2040 Fiscally Constrained Plan. Um, we actually just did candidate project submittals directly from local governments. Um, each local government got two, maybe three, uh, whatever, you know, sort of candidate projects that they submitted to us directly. Um, and we considered that approach this time, but you all and we all have invested such work in the forums, standing those up, having that as a place for collaboration and working together. The forums just felt like the natural uh, place to have these conversations about identifying priorities. That said, we are not looking to make a lot of work for the forums. This is not the tip. These are not specific projects that are going to go into a tip and get funded and, and constructed tomorrow, right? That's a point we've made all along. So in asking the forums to prioritize projects to candidate projects to send to us for evaluation, yeah, we should talk through a little bit what that looks like. We haven't purposely sort of proposed or dictated anything in particular because we don't want to have that heavy hand um, approach with the forums. You all are unique and have your own processes for how you work together. But whatever, however we get there, we are not intending a lot of work or a lot of you know, quantitative analysis or scoring by the forums to, to prioritize projects. What we are hoping is that the forums will have uh, collaborative conversation about local priorities um, to be able to give us those list of candidate projects. Thank you for that. I, I think the area that I'm still trying to figure out is it's it's the after the sub regional or the sub or the forum discussions. It's when everyone on this call, including CDOT and RTD, when we have the laundry list of all these different projects, I feel like there that needs to be iterative. Is that so? Once we have the laundry list, it's like, well, you know, who's on first? And then also if Denver suggesting and RTD suggesting, um, say, a, a BRT on a certain corridor, and then the neighboring city that it goes into is like, well, that's not a priority for us. I mean, so I that's where usually, like, there's a, there's a, a need for for strong um, collaboration, and I that's what I'm questioning: is that built into here? I that is a good question, Eileen. Sorry, Jacob. Oh, Eileen, this is go ahead, Yes, that is built into this. And uh, again, acknowledging the important role that that CDOT and RTD play in this play in this process as um, the primary partners with uh, as part of the MPO and developing the metropolitan planning, the metropolitan transportation plan. That that interagency coordination process where we take all those priorities in and we work through that. Um, Balanced against available available resources and the and the financial plan to develop that draft, um, there will be a review of that. We will be talking to um, the locals, and you'll you'll have review and input to that um, through the TAC, the RTC, and the board before before we finalize that uh, for TAC endorsement at the end of at the end of September. I mean, should we just block off? The Monday afternoons from here through <laughs> September. Yeah, it's certainly possible that we may As have work some session. I mean, I'm all good with that. Yeah, you all just need to tell me, like, do it now. And yep. I think it would be so. Just tossing that out there. I mean, to bring light, but also from seriousness, is that I, you know, if if we're building that in, and then that's our expectations is to keep having work sessions. Say, you know, between August and September, um, that could be. Good. I mean. Just toss you know let it the sooner the the better when it comes to again um looking for that collaborative process sure yeah Eileen, i think I, I hope we all hope that we probably don't have a work session every single week between now and september but um as staff we do uh, we do want to have access to work sessions and have that capability to do that with you all because this is a good way to work through some of these things thank you thank you are there other hands raised, Melinda? 
Uh, yes, thank you. It looks like our next question or comment is from uh, David Kretzinger. So David, go ahead. Hello everyone, David Kretzinger. Um, thanks to um, Dr. Cog and uh, Rebecca for the earlier comments. I wanted to respond a little bit to Art's question about what's the transit picture look like. I think the statewide transportation plan with its view out to 2045 won't be a surprise to anyone and it's I think can stand as the, the vision to, out to 2050 as well. Um, I think in that plan we've um, <clears throat> expressed a, a vision to have mobility hubs about every 10 miles north and south on I-25 from Fort Collins to Pueblo and expand service over that time um, unless and until there's a front range passenger rail implementation in which case there would be some sort of reworking of how busting and front range rail would relate to each other. Um, so that's the, the big picture. I think no surprises there. And then getting into things like uh, regional BRT corridors, I think that's, um, I defer that, those kinds of conversations to both RTD priorities and the priorities of local governments and their willingness to put in money or partner and go after projects. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, any other hands raised? Uh, at the moment, I am not seeing any other hands raised. Okay. I do want to remind everybody that these are major projects that go in for the uh, testing of the network, not minor projects. Um, if Jacob, do you have any additional items? Um, just maybe one point actually on what you just raised, Mr. Chair. Um, didn't have a slide on it, but um, your comment just now reminded me of it. In the memo for this agenda item, one of the things we talked about was that very point of, you know, th this is a focus on major projects, not minor projects. And I'm actually going to pull up the memo uh, just so we can, if you'll give me a second, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, so we don't lose that point. Yeah, so for those who read the memo, um, when we're having this conversation about the types of projects that we're talking about, uh, the federally required projects that I've mentioned, uh, the major capacity projects, um, the other sort of major projects in the planning framework that we've talked about, and then where my cursor is, if you all can see that um, at the top of this page, this last bullet, um, you know, it says here that because the BRTP does not individually identify smaller scale projects, and we've talked about that, the you know, the local sidewalks or the local bus service type, maintenance type projects, um, a minimum project cost threshold may be an appropriate proxy to identify major projects for purposes of this solicitation. And we threw out a number of three million. I don't know that we need to sort of decide that or approve that here, but the point we're getting at is to what you just said, Mr. Chair, is that when the forums think about, you know, what level of project, what type of project do I want to submit um, as a candidate project um, for this exercise, you know, is it worth sort of thinking about, is that a helpful way to think about, you know, what is a major project as opposed to a, a, a minor project? So I just wanted to make that point. My, my only comment there, Jacob, is if you're thinking of an intersection project as a smaller scale project, then your threshold needs to be a little higher. Some of those can run 3 million pretty quickly anymore. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Melinda. We did have a hand go up uh, if you'd like to entertain another question or comment. Sure. Okay, uh, looks like it is from uh, Paul Gisaitis. So Paul, go ahead. Yeah, hey, uh, so it seems like there's some questions on CDOT's tenure list. So, um, you know, that was a, when we created that tenure list, we were given a uh, funding constraint of $922 million. And I think it's worth pointing out that um, most of the projects on that list were scaled back to sort of uh, more of a bare bones. What could we get done for that critical need? If you um, expanded out the scope on just those, I think there's 27 projects, the actual cost of those projects is 2.1 billion. Um, and so then we also have the below the line and that list sits at 3.9 billion. So um, anybody who's, um, you know, just wants to get an early look at what our list might look like, you can take a look at that tenure list and 
just understand a lot of the full scope would require things like total revenue to make um, whole or, um, or to make the scope what we really think it needs to be would require us to uh, spend an awful lot more money than uh, what we were given in that 10 year list. So maybe that helps and I'm sure we can provide that 10 year list to anybody who wants to see it. Thank you, Paul. Melinda, are there any other questions? Um, I am not seeing any other hands raised. Okay. Jacob, do you want to wrap up then? Uh, sure. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, again, we appreciate the conversation. We appreciate everyone's time, uh, both today as well as last week's work session. Uh, what our intention here is to kind of take what we heard today, um, again, kind of wrap everything that we've talked about the last three times we've been together, starting with the May TAC meeting, the June 8th work session, today's work session, kind of condense that, wrap that together, bring that back to you um, next week for our regular June 22nd. Uh, TAC meeting on this. Okay, thank you. Um, there not being any further questions, we'll uh, see you or we'll hear you at least all uh, next Monday uh, at the regular TAC meeting. So thank you and uh, have a good rest of your week. And we are adjourned. Thanks, Kat.